mentioned Janine, which we should never forget. We should never forget that what's happening in the West Bank. Sorry, microphone, okay. The issue is not Gaza only, although Gaza suffers the most and been suffering the most, but the issue is 75 years of ongoing ethnic cleansing, ongoing settler colonialism, ongoing war crimes. Only 10 days, I'm going to mention it. 10 days ago, two children were killed. Mohammed Tamimi, two years old, shot in the forehead, and Sudil, a young woman, 13 years old, again shot and killed. Did the world pay any attention? Not at all, not at all, they don't count. And we must remember that those crimes are happening all over Palestine, they've been happening for a long time. Gaza is a major issue, but it's not the only issue, although I come from there, and I love, I love it uh, a lot. Uh, when we talk about the siege of the Gaza Strip, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the uh, flotilla for their bravery and their, they're so important what they're doing because they're going to highlight the siege of Gaza. And again, I don't want to put the siege of Gaza in the context of humanitarian issue because it's not. It is and it's not. Because collective punishment, we talked about attacks on hospitals, but collective punishment of two million people is a war crime, not my words, under international law. The siege of Gaza, the hijacking of international waters, which those brave people are going, trying to, to break, the hijacking of international waters is against international law. Everything Israel commits is against international law. So it's a political issue more than humanitarian. Humanitarian is very important but we must understand what we're dealing with. Gaza, what the, the crimes they commit against Gaza affects every aspect of the Gazan people, mainly patients, children. I'm gonna share with you a story three years ago. Please remember the name and Google it. And please say the story to everybody you know to see and, and expose the brutality of the Israeli government that we are dealing with, the Israeli state that we are dealing with, Aisha and Lulu, Aisha and Lulu, five years old, five year old Palestinian dying of cancer. After long, long, long periods of applying for permissions, there is no cure for cancer in the Gaza Strip. They have to go either to Egypt, Jordan, or the West Bank, or sometimes inside Israeli hospital. After long period of waiting, they allowed her on her own five years old. The images of Aisha dying with a mobile phone or WhatsApp she's talking while dying to her family should remain in people's minds forever. I'm sorry, I'm... we talked about it earlier. <laughs> I'm sorry. A five-year-old child talking on the mobile phone while dying Last woman, her parents can't reach her. Aisha Lulu, remember her? Remember her very well. Because a world that is full of double standards should be challenged. A country like Israel, which is pain in fact, should be challenged. Aisha Lulu is a clear, clear example of the brutality of this state. A five year old dying on her own because they wouldn't give her mother a permission to be with her. This is the type of oppression, this is the type of war crimes we are dealing with. Uh, of course, not only Aisha, medical equipments, the CT scan, we have doctors here, broke down in the major hospital in Gaza. It took a year, it needs a tube, a small tube. One year passed before they allowed the tube to be, to, to be sent to Gaza, to allow it to, to pass to Gaza. That's again, if you put it away from international law, isn't this a crime? What would the tube affect the Israeli, the Israeli mighty state, one of the most powerful states in the world? But the level of crimes are unbelievable. Fishermen, they are trying to highlight the issue of fishermen. And it just happened that I am very heavily involved with fishermen in the Gaza Strip because last year I visited them when I was there. And despite my so-called knowledge, I was shocked and ashamed. I felt ashamed when I saw the conditions of 
the Palestinian fishermen. When I saw the stories that were told to me by families, by fishermen, the stories of people in failing, ailing, rusty boats. Some of these boats have lorries, motors, because the Israelis are not allowed any motor to go. If, if a boat breaks, they put a lorry. lorry a lorry, a lorry, you know, a truck engine is not as strong as a boat itself. So those people are well known by name to the Israeli Navy. All the boats are known to the Israeli Navy. No danger, not a single case, not a single case of smuggling, of anything by the fishermen. How can they? How can they? The boats are so, and yet, remember this statistic and tell it to people, 330 attacks by the Navy on, on Palestinian fishermen boats in the year 2022. 330, almost every day. And the humiliation, they arrest them, and to prove that there is no, no, no case, they arrest them today, they take them to Asdud, and the following day they release them. They ask them to jump in, in December, in, 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 uh, in January, they strip down to their boxes, and from 200 meters, they order them to jump in the water and swim towards the, the frigate, the Israeli Navy frigate. Those are statements I'm going to have in the new film I'm making about the fishermen. I hope I come back to, to Liverpool and show it next year because I'll finish it. Hopefully, we'll finish it in September. They swim when they're freezing. They attack the nets. They, they destroy the nets. They destroy the storage rooms. They humiliate the fishermen. And I'm very proud to say that they appeal to us because not only the fishermen are attacked by the Israelis, they're ignored by the Palestinian leadership on both sides. they ignored. So the fishermen have no rescue boat. When, when the Israeli attack a boat, how long do I have? Five minutes? Okay. I'll, when they attack a boat, they have to wait and wait for hours until they get the boat, somebody volunteers and they send it. So I'm so honored and proud to say that we started the campaign in Shafid and we managed to secure the funds. Some of you here, maybe Helen doesn't want to mention it, but Helen contributed. And we are going to build them this rescue boat, which is very modest. We'll do it locally. We'll employ Palestinian fishermen to do it. And we'll have, hopefully, we'll find a second-hand second uh, engine and a pump. And that's a major achievement. Can you believe the level of abandonment these people suffer? It's like walking into the, the Gaza port. It's like a shocking scene. Shocking scene. You meet, you meet fishermen. I met Ahmed al hissi Again, he'll be in the film. Lost two sons to the Israeli army attacks. Two sons. For no reason. They were fishing. And then a frigate came and, and just split the, the, uh, the boat in two. And until now, his body wasn't recovered because they can't recover it. The second one, after water cannons, because they play like shh, water cannons every day. He was, after the, after the Israeli Navy went, he went to, to fix the boat and, and he, was, he, he was killed by electrical shock. Of course, caused by the water cannons. <laughs> Otherwise, why? You know, how can he have an electrical shock? If, you know, I met, I mean, for instance, Abu Adham al-Habil, a very good, uh, somebody I befriended. He's, sadly, he's dying of cancer. And he's a captain, they call him Rais. His boat, last week, was destroyed by the Israelis while he's in Jordan in the hospital. This is the level of crimes, travel restrictions in the Gaza Strip. Unbelievable. The God, two million people, and, and let, me, let me say something I want to share with you. Egypt doesn't control the Rafah border crossing, although it appears as if it controls it, but it doesn't. I have no sympathy with the criminal regime of, of, of General Sisi of Egypt, but the, the 1979, remember that agreement gives Israel the control, so Egyptians open the border when the Israelis say so. And they proved it before, because when some leaders came, they said, this leader goes, this leader doesn't enter. It happened. So, <coughs> two minutes. So the level of oppression, the farmers and their suffering, the farmers on the eastern border, very, very poor, deprived farmers, every day, bulldozers come for no reason, tanks come for no reason, just go through their crops. Electricity in the Gaza Strip, we are facing an environmental disaster because for the sewage treatment plants to work, they need 14 hours of non-stop 
electricity. In the Gaza didn't have this in 20 years, even before the sea. So partially treated sewage are dumped into the Mediterranean Sea. Environmentalists should act. If they care about the trees in Britain, they should care about water worldwide. The attacks on the Palestinians, on every aspect of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. And I just want to mention something, please, because the Zionist propaganda, because in any society there are middle classes and people who are living, living life to the full. And in Gaza there are. There are suburbs in Gaza, which if you go there, it's very posh. Villas and posh restaurants, whatever there are. But those are non-representative of the Gaza population at all. 75% of the Gaza Strip suffer what is called food insecurity. This means that they're reliant on, they're reliant on food parcels. 75%. 35% are suffering, this is by World Health Organization, of abject poverty. They live in poverty, 35%. 75% food insecurity. So you will find these posh areas. And the Israelis will show in their videos, look at Gaza, look at the, menu, the supermarkets, because there is. If you go to Gaza, main high, high street, yes. There is like, if you don't know the picture and you don't go to the back streets and see the poverty, see the level of poverty, I, with the help of, of good people like you, a family of 11 people living in one room, we help them build another room. I'm not saying, of course, but that, that's a family of thousands of families. People living in real, real shocking events, but then the Zionists pick a small suburb of Western Riman in Gaza and say, look how they live. It's a lie, as they lie through their teeth. So please be careful about this. The mental health issue, when, when the Israelis, one minute, finish? Okay. The mental health, we can pick, pick things up in the discussion. Mental health issues. A few years ago, and that was a few years ago, the, uh, the uh, World Health Organization, and, oh, the United Nations, sorry, said 375 thousand Palestinian children in the Gaza Strip suffer from some form of PTSD, one, one or two or three symptoms, the wood betting, uh, sorry, bed wetting, uh, uh, insomnia, stuff like that, so, you know, anxiety. So every aspect is affected, and yet it's going, yet Israel is portraying the, the people of the Gaza Strip as terrorists who should be attacked and should be. We should not listen to this propaganda. We should fight it. We should be very strong in our opposition, we are campaigners for peace, we are campaigners for tolerance, we are campaigners for coexistence, but we cannot really, when the, when, the, when, the, when the sword and the knife is on the necks of the Palestinians, metaphorically speaking, reward the Israelis by saying, you know, you know oh, we can talk to you, whatever. No, this regime needs to be condemned. This regime needs to be fought because they commit war crimes and we should stand firm and raise our heads high and say, we support the Palestinians because we fight war crimes. Thank you very much.